end of this series of conversations about the big issues that are going to determine what sort of society we hand on to our kids and our grandchildren. Uh, you're an eminent uh, intellectual uh, from the United Kingdom. You spend quite a bit of time in Australia. Uh, you and I come from probably, in traditional terms anyway, the way they might be described, different political perspectives. And yet it seems we're in furious agreement on two things that we think would be critical to the future of our society. One is the way in which we socialise our children, the environment in which they grow up in and who accepts responsibility for it and how it's carried forward. The other is that we have to ensure that we rediscover and lock down what we once understood about a respectful public debate. Yeah, I think that's crucially important that the socialisation of the younger generation is the responsibility of their parents. They're the ones that are responsible with, for them. They're the ones that have to live the consequences of their action. They're the ones that are intimately involved and really understand what makes their children tick. And even the most sophisticated expert with millions of PhD degrees is not really able to understand the context within which a child grows up. And what I'm really worried about is that we've tended to professionalize child rearing we're asking experts and teachers and social workers to make judgment calls about young people. And even with the best will in the world, uh, they basically approach young people with a pre-existing formula, template, which very often doesn't correspond to the real needs of children. So I'm very firmly of the opinion that the battle for socializing kids by parents is, is a non-negotiable issue. And yet we see this enormous push to almost enlist the state at this early stage as co-parents, if you like, towards what seems to be a drift uh, in, in the direction of the state knows best, the nanny state, as many Australians would call it. Yes, or, or in Britain we call it the politics of behaviour, where there's an assumption that most parents are too stupid or lack the intellectual resources to know what's in the best interest of their child. And for that reason, you have to bring in all these other people to give their opinion and what that simply forgets is that for um, thousands of years people, ordinary people without any education almost intuitively understood what their children need. Uh, most parents, 99.9% .9 of them, uh, act with the best possible intention and it seems to me that if you disrupt that relationship between a child and a parent, you don't just simply disrupt it temporarily, you undermine that organic dynamic that you need to have for the sake of the child developing in a mature, independent way. And that's what I'm really worried about with the present trends. I think I read somewhere that you'd said something to the effect that the greatest mistake the West has made is to deconstruct its families. I, I, I didn't actually say that precisely, but I do think that we've become very uncomfortable with the family. I know that families have a lot of problems, that you know, even if you're well off, sometimes you struggle, relationships, are often facing all kinds of challenges. But at the end of the day, uh, the family is the only unit that we have uh, that can effectively bring children up. More importantly, the only unit that we have that can take responsibility for the long-term future of a child, which is why we see so often when children are taken into care, children are taken into homes, even when the people that look after them have the best of intentions, they're not able to assume the same kind of responsibility. Mm -hmm. They're not in a position to guarantee the welfare of that child in the long run than a mother or a father mm -hmm. whose commitment is for life. So, uh, just to tease that out in a slightly Australian context, you, you come here often, you know the country amazingly well. You obviously have an affection for Australia. I sometimes say of Australia we're of the West but we're not in it. <laughs> in many ways we're one of the youngest of the Western countries, we're least encumbered by debt, we probably have some of the best prospects of any country in the West. But if our future is our children, how do you feel about these trends that you're talking about playing out in Australia? Well, I see some very important battles ahead. I think one of the nice things about Australia is there is a certain basic fundamental decency that you detect just by interacting with people on the street you know, when I have conversations with the people that I bump into, I'm very often astonished uh, by the kind of strong sense of character and optimism that they project. I understand that there are other kind of Australians as well. Not everybody 
has that kind of robust, resilient attitude towards the future that many ordinary Australians have. But what I'm concerned about is that at the moment in Australia, you know, you have a situation where on the one hand, unlike in many other Western societies, you still got that fairly resilient attitude towards the future, the this capacity and a desire to make things happen. But at the same time, we also have a, a kind of cultural elite or cultural oligarchy who's very contemptuous of the ordinary Australian, which I often detect, especially when I talk to some of my academic colleagues, they always talk about the other Australia as this alien territory where you've got these natives who have all these apparent prejudices and who for some reason are not prepared to sign up to their way of life. And I think what worries me is that their influence, if, uh, if it remains unchecked, can create a, uh, potentially quite an unhealthy dynamic. Because unless the ordinary people of Australia get a bit more confident voice in the public domain, in the political domain, people that actually are organically linked to them mm -hmm. and be able to express their, their views and sentiments, we may have some trouble in the future. Does it bring to mind the sort of phenomenon you saw in Britain with Brexit and America with Trump? A little bit. I think they're all a little bit different. I think uh, uh, Brexit in Britain was a wonderful moment in the sense that a lot of people I talked to uh, told me, you know, Frank, this is the first time I feel that my vote really matters. Usually when I vote, it's in a safe Labour seat or a safe Tory seat. And it doesn't matter how I vote. Mm -hmm. The results were pretty predictable, but this time my vote really counts. And a lot of people felt elated by the results. Mm -hmm. And I remember the morning after the Brexit results came in, you could, f you could almost sense this kind of uh, passion of joy mm -hmm. amongst a section of society. I remember going to my butcher and uh, they asked me, how did you vote, Frank? And I said, well, you know, uh, I voted for Brexit. And when I said that, they all started laughing and smiling. Says, why are you laughing at me? Says, well, you're a professor, you're an academic. People like you don't vote for Brexit. And I thought that was quite telling, that in their eyes, if you're intellectual, if you're educated, somehow you would be, uh, uh, in a sense, part of a different milieu than, than they are, and, and therefore you would be an anti-Brexit. And that tension between mm. the uh, educated section of society, especially the educated elite, and ordinary folk has become very deep indeed. What worries me in Australia, because I see that same thing unfolding here, what particularly worries me is not just that it's anti-democratic, uh, it's that some of the core values that are lie at the heart of the success of Western freedom um, have been under pretty ferocious attack recently. And there's been a very noticeable silence from far too much of the political leadership, the academic leadership, the media leadership, uh, and indeed, for that matter, business leadership, in, if you like, pointing to the dangers of silencing people and of belittling and marginalising people of a different view. In other words, there seems to be a lack of recognition of the importance of freedom of speech and association, foundational yeah. freedoms, the ones by which we contribute to the public debate, and indeed defend our other freedoms. So it's not just that people offend the rules, so to speak, it's that they don't stand up for them. Yeah. The elites, I think, look very anti-democratic when they do that. Yeah, I mean, they would, they would protest and they would argue that they're not anti-democratic. They, they would say that they actually believe in democracy more than anybody. But actually, when you probe the surface a little bit, you'll discover that they have a very uh, selective approach towards democracy and they have a very selective approach towards freedom and you'll find that they will always find really good excuses why in this particular case, you know, sort of freedom is not applicable. So the way that I would sum up their attitude is what they really believe in is, I believe in freedom, but. And what comes after the but is really far more important than anything else. And I think that this uh, selective approach towards freedom is linked to their contempt for popular sovereignty. Because at the end of the day, they really, they really don't believe that ordinary people left to their own devices could vote the right way, could come to the right conclusion. They, they really think there are two classes of people that are the experts who are like uh, mor the moral authority, they, they have these incredible insights, and then there are everybody else who for some reason haven't got the intellectual resources to make the right kind of judgments. And I think that 
dislike of popular sovereignty, together with uh, their reluctance to allow freedom, its full scope, makes for a very dangerous combination. Well, I think those forces are alive and well here, and I think there is a deep resentment in much of Australia about it. But let's come now, you've written extensively on what's happened to the university and related themes. Uh, let's tease that out a bit, because many of these elites are highly educated. Uh, when I went to university uh, in the 70s, relatively few Australians went to university. Now, of course, it's a huge chunk of our young people, so they're more influential than ever. Yeah. And going back to what you said earlier about socialising our children, you're writing that our universities now uh, increasingly socialise our young. Are they the right people to socialise our young? And secondly, what sort of job are they doing at it? So, so there are two problems here. I think that uh, it's not really their business to socialise young people. Uh, they're not responsible for the long-term consequences uh, of what happens to those young people in the long run. But even more importantly, insofar as they're doing uh, uh, the job of socialization, they very often socialize young people into the wrong values, or what I think are the wrong values. You know, when I went to the universities in the 60s, and I was a student radical, I was involved in occupations and demonstrations, we used to argue for more freedom. That was the whole buzz, that you wanted more freedom, more free speech, almost uh, an anarchistic anything goes, that everybody should be able to express themselves in accordance with their inclinations. Today what you have is a situation where the scope for exercising freedom is continually being contracted. And we've now come to the point where the aspiration for freedom is far greater outside the university than in inside the universities. In other words, universities as a terrain have become more illiberal than the rest of society, which is a complete reversal to, to what happened in human history in the past. And then they become the people who overwhelmingly work their way into positions of power and influence where they have the voice. So it exacerbates the problem, I suspect. That's right. In other words, you have a situation where the university provides a pathway for a small number of people to gain power and influence. Mm. And when they do gain influence, the values that they project into the public domain are those that they picked up within the university setting. And even more insidiously, you have a situation, and it's very much the same in Australia as in England, where the people that are promoting these values are actually a small minority. But because the rest of the campuses, the other academics, the other students, are either indifferent or cowed, uh, they basically don't resist or protest against that. But nevertheless, as time goes along, they begin to internalize those values that they themselves never believed in the first place because they only hear one side of the argument. We have 42 universities in Australia. The Institute of Public Affairs did a bit of research and established that only one of them uh, had places no restrictions on freedom of speech. Yes, now, I, well, that's pretty much the case. I'm, I mean, I'm, I often feel that when I go on campuses and I give my lectures, I often say things that people are shocked by. And afterwards, when we have drinks with other faculty members, people come up to me and say, you know, you can get away with that because you've got a reputation, you're a bit older, um, you know, nobody's going to give you a hard time. But if I, as a younger academic, said something similar, I would be, in a, in a sense, marginalized and, and, and given a really hard time by faculty. Let's drill into that. That's a really serious observation, I would have thought. So in effect, what you're telling us is that there are Australian academics who cannot speak their mind, cannot point to those things which they believe to be true for fear of offending someone and then landing themselves in trouble? Well, I, I look at it a little bit differently. I, there's a lot of, not a lot, but there's a fair number of academics in Britain and Australia who know what's right and what's wrong in their hearts of hearts. They know that a lot of the developments in universities is going in the wrong direction. But what they do is they keep their ideas to themselves. Whenever I talk to them, you know, privately or off the record, I always tell them it's a shame that you're keeping silent because we're not living in Stalinist Russia or Nazi Germany. And if you stood up and argued your case, you'd be surprised by what you could get away with. And I think it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. The less you speak out, the more difficult it becomes to speak out. And I, I still think that it's still possible to ha have your voice heard. Uh, it's still possible to counter some of these influences, even in academia. But unfortunately, 
people feel very insecure about going on record and doing that. Does that mean then that we're facing the real prospect that whole university courses in very important disciplines are carefully designed though to not offend and to, if you like, stay in the mainstream, not the challenge thinking, but rather to conform and to confirm preconceived ideas that are dominant at the time? Yeah, I mean, it it's, hasn't happened totally yet, but you now have a lot of academics who will no longer lecture on certain topics, uh, who will avoid discussing certain issues in case it offends people, particularly in the social sciences mm. and the humanities. And I've talked to many of them who say, you know, uh, as a sociologist, you know how important it is to discuss suicide. The text by Emil Durkheim on suicide is one of the most fundamental texts in sociology. But because suicide has become a very controversial issue, because we don't, we, we're worried that students might commit suicide because we're discussing suicide, they stop discussing it. And people have stopped talking about you know, other controversial issues to do with violence and war and rape and domestic abuse. A, a lot of these things have been to some extent sanitized on, on many campuses. What sort of mechanisms are used? You've written about this quite extensively uh, to, if you like, um, almost uh, neuter full-blooded debate uh, and, and yeah. avoid the risk of saying things that are offensive. Well, in, in many campuses, you have the idea of safe spaces, where the idea of a safe space is, is that you're immunized from criticism uh, and from judgment. And in the old days, a safe space was just a room. But in many campuses, you now have whole universities declared to be safe spaces. So that means that debate is almost impossible. You have uh, speech rules, you know, codes of mm -hmm. conduct, which means that there are certain words you cannot use. If you use the words, you get uh, done uh, under a particular code of conduct and you can be kicked out of university or disciplined. And there is a vast variety of legal instruments that have been uh, innovated, which are there to regulate uh, and create a kind of linguistic policing uh, of the way that people behave. And very often, students use a word that an uh, academic thinks is not right, they will be told to change their language or to speak in a different kind of way, which to me is a real negation of academic life because in academia is the one place where you're meant to be able to open up your heart and uh, express your ideas in accordance with your inclinations. I think it was John Stuart Mill who said something to the effect that an opinion uh, no matter how robustly held is worthless if you haven't understood Absolutely. the opposing perspective and worked out in your own mind why your opinion uh, is the one that you adhere to. If you're simply accepting it as rote learning, it's worthless. It is, and, and very often, I'm sure you had this experience, you realise the strengths and weaknesses of your arguments when you were forced to debate it and, and you were forced to account mm -hmm. for yourself. And very often, uh, I've been forced to modify my opinions because I realized that there were real gaps in my logic and uh, I'm thankful to those people whose I ideas I disagreed with that they kind of forced me to realize some of my errors. So two issues arise immediately in my mind. The first is, um, what does it say about the resilience of young people today? And I'm not blaming them, I have four young ones of my own. You have mm -hmm. a son, uh, so let's not condemn them. Let's talk about what we're doing in terms of the environment that we're raising them in. What does, this, what does this say about their resilience, given that we can't always assume we're going to be able to guarantee safe places? Life's not yeah. like that, and the world's not like that. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a problem in the sense that the dominant way that we socialise young people, even parents, is no longer to socialise them into values, and certainly not to cultivate their habit of independence, and not to, not to cultivate their habit of freedom. But instead, we are told to validate our children. So we're told to uh, praise them. So when they make, mi make mistakes, instead of saying, you're wrong, you know, sort of we have to hold back and say, there's another way of doing things. Uh, we're told to minimize the pressure that they're under. Uh, we uh, try to avoid them taking risks and to experiment, which is all part and parcel of gaining strength as a child. You know, it's through making mistakes, it's through uh, facing challenging situation that you gain your strength. And if you're being validated all the time, if every time you open your mouth as a child, the teacher gives you five smiley faces and says, good on you, instead of saying, actually, this really wasn't very good, 
you need to get your act together. If, if that's the way they evolved, then it's not surprising that many young people, when they get to be 18 or 19 or 20, um, become estranged from adulthood. And instead of being young men and young women, they become biologically mature children uh, who find it very difficult to deal with the world. I often make the point that if you talk to 18, 19 year olds about the, their problems, they always use this incredibly sophisticated psychological language to describe their predicament. So they say, oh, I'm really stressed. Man, I'm really depressed. I need to chill out. It's almost like they read Sigmund Freud to discuss the problems of their existence instead of saying, well, I had a few problems, you know, but all sorted. So when you begin to think in this kind of therapeutic kind of a way, uh, then you're emotionally more confused and more disoriented to deal with the real hard knocks of life. To me, this raises a very, very important issue, and it's to do with the changing nature of politics. Now, I don't think any of the old language really applies anymore. Um, people might paint me as a political conservative, they might paint you in old-fashioned language as a, somebody from the left. In reality, I would suggest that all those old descriptions are increasingly irrelevant, because here we are, I think, agreeing on a couple of the most basic fundamentals of all for freedom in the future. But one of the things that I want to explore for a moment is that it seems to me that in the name of what's now called identity politics, those people who once nobly, from if I can use it this way, your side of politics, sought to ensure that the weak, the oppressed, the working classes were recognised for all their worth and dignity as card-carrying members of a broad society. Now, and, and fought against the idea of aristocracies and, yeah. and what have you, now seem to be seeking to create an aristocratic class of their own. You get this sort of identity politics spills over into victim politics. And if you can portray yourself as a victim, you seem to expect that everyone will affirm you in your victimhood rather than challenge your thinking and suggest that perhaps there's a different way to do it. In fact, yeah. you're guilty of hate speech unless you affirm. Yeah. Is there a tendency for that to play out now, perhaps uh, yeah. the way we raise our kids and indeed yeah, it, socialise our it is. It, it's a very strange process because it appears on the surface that it's a conscious strategy that's being promoted, but I don't think it is. I think that people, I think that people when they become disoriented, begin to lose sight of the big picture and their worldview becomes one of, it's all about me. A kind of narcissistic turn where mm -hmm. what matters is your identity rather than solidarity with others or the rest mm -hmm. of society. And I think you know, when it's all about you, and when you realize that uh, it's your identity that really kind of matters, you do get to the point where you're drawn towards a political ideal that uh, celebrates being victimized. Because being victimized simply means that somebody disrespects you, doesn't affirm you all the time. I mean, imagine if by mistake you don't affirm somebody. Well, if you do that, then you've offended that person and you've turned that person into a victim. You know, and, and, and that's a status that's got real moral currency mm. at the moment. And people are kind of drawn towards that. Mm. And it's not as if it's done consciously, but it's the zeitgeist of our time, mm. which, which basically judges us, not by our accomplishments, but by our identity. That's the big development yeah. that has occurred. And that has a huge implication for not just politics, but for public life. I must say, uh, we have a fast and furious debate in this country, as many Western countries have about marriage. Uh, and we see many people who really come from a political perspective that, in my day at university, uh, didn't think marriage, they thought it was actually a, a bad construct, we yeah. ought to do away with it. Now suddenly they embrace it, and one wonders whether that's not the, 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 the triumph of identity politics over real belief. Well it is, I mean, I, I'm old enough to remember when gay liberation as a movement emerged in the 1970s. And one of the arguments of gay liberation was, you know, forget about marriage. You know, let's just go out and, mm. you know, have fluid relationship. And they were critical of heterosexual people for getting hitched up and putting a finger on each other. And that used to be a very different movement than the way that gay identity politics has emerged today, where it's really uh, very much about gaining more and more recognition. And I think what's very interesting is that uh, the, even in the gay community, you now have a development where it's not good enough just to be a, a gay person. Increasingly in England, white gay men are criticized for not being really gay. Mm. 
Uh, whereas if you're a disabled uh, gay person, or if you're a lesbian, then you have more moral status. And you have this segmentation occurring even within the gay community itself. And I think one of the things that we're seeing is that as you have the affirmation of identity politics, then the segregation of society becomes increasingly more and more pronounced, uh, which is why the marriage issue is so interesting, because what the marriage issue does uh, in de facto, if, if not de jure, is actually say to us that what really matters in our world is not the institution of marriage, but the affirmation of a particular identity. Yeah. And once you've opened the door to that, then you're opening the door to the affirmation of identities in all kinds of different ways that we've never even dreamt of. So in simple terms, uh, uh, an Australian in the street, and we've established that we have a great respect for them, yeah. uh, they might say about that, the problem is we're so intent on emphasising our differences that we're lacking the ability to find the things we have in common, and that cripples our ability to go forward. Well, it's more than that, because I think what's really happening is that anything that we have in common mm. becomes increasingly diminished, yeah. and it becomes increasingly questioned. And if you say, well, you know, what does that make us... Australians, or, or what makes us French or English, you're asking the wrong question. Because by, by asking the question of what it means to be Australian, you're diminishing the experience of all these other identities. And in a sense, what happens is you kind of empty the meaning of an Australian out of any meaning under those kinds of circumstances. So it does have a really corrosive effect on public life for the very simple reason that there are no points of contact. And even the, the, the small areas where we have points of contact are being challenged be, by these particular cultural trends that we're discussing. So just to backtrack for a moment then, if we no longer feel able to express our real views, heaven only knows how you parent if you can't say to a child, I disagree with you and I think you're wrong precisely because I love you. But if we're not allowed you know, to not affirm someone's behaviour because that's seen as hate speech, it brings us, I think, to the issue of free speech the willingness and the ability and uh, what have you to argue, if necessarily robustly, but in a respectful and non-personal way, if we're ever to get good public policy? Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing that precedes that is that we should never get ourselves into the mindset of saying that we're not allowed to say whatever we want to say. I think we need people to be brave enough to stand up and say whatever they believe is the truth. Mm -hmm. I think that's really qu quite important. I think at the moment, far few people who know better, politicians and other public figures, are being a little bit cowardly in the way they communicate their ideas in the public domain. Because the situation is not yet Hitler's Germany or Stalin's Russia. There's a lot of scope for pushing back and to fighting back. But then, of course, if we allow uh, this intolerant uh, sort of dynamic to gain greater force, then what happens is that public de debate becomes denuded of any content. Yeah. And what you end up is an entirely technocratic discussion uh, where the policy becomes uh, fairly arbitrary and loses any connection with any kind of values. Because as Australians or as English people or French people, the fundamental question that we need to raise in relation to any policy is what kind of life do we want for our children? Mm. What kind of world do we want to live in? And if those moral issues become marginalized entirely, then we do impoverish our public life to a, a tremendous extent. I have to agree. I can't say that I could see it in any other way. Now, um, we have, I think, for a long time lived by the sort of Enlightenment era adage, summarized later by a later author, but the, the sort of view that I may disagree with you, but I defend the right uh, to the death you're right to say it. It really implies a couple of pretty important things. No matter how much we may differ uh, and how uh, different our backgrounds or our circumstances or whatever it may be, uh, we each have equal worth and dignity. Not the same, yeah. but we each have equal worth and dignity. Uh, and that probably came out of a rich heritage of reformation and enlightenment thinking. You and I, I think would both subscribe to that idea. It seems to me that it's critically important that we recapture the willingness to respect one another uh, and encourage them to put their ideas on the table and then debate the ideas and answer the questions that arise rather than attacking one another. But the modern adage seems to be that if I disagree with you, it comes out of this identity politics in some ways, then I'll fight to the death your right to even put it because it 
I'll characterize it as hate speech or as racist or something yeah, yeah. incredibly unholy. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're right. I think the key battleground in the first instance is conscience. Yeah. I think uh, if you look at historically, the freedom of conscience was the first crucial mm. step that we took along the road of developing our modern mm. idea of freedom. And Locke and people like that in the 18th century wrote on tolerance. Mm. In the first instant, they talked about the importance of conscience. And the thing was that once we began to realize that we should be able to act in accordance with our conscience, at least express our conscience, then sooner or later other people said, well, yeah, that's true, but we also need to be able to voice that. And at that point, we began to develop the idea of the freedom mm. of speech. And then with the passing of time, we said, well, not only do we need conscience, the freedom of conscience and freedom of speech, but we also need freedom of expression, of expressing ourselves in accordance with who we really are. So all these things are intimately in, in interconnected. And unless we recognize that, then basically we, we're losing what is the fundamental tenant hmm. of modern Western civilization. And at the end of the day, uh, unless we allow people to say whatever they want to say, however disrespectful, however horrible, then what we are saying is that freedom of speech becomes entirely an arbitrary yeah. selective co accomplishment. Mm -hmm. And you've noted that's becoming something of a theme in our universities. Absolutely. I mean, for me, what's important about the freedom of speech is that it's its, it's content. Mm. It's, it's the fact that I'm forced to listen to accounts that I find really uncomfortable, I might even really dislike. And I think as, as a society, uh, moral and intellectual development comes about through the engagement and the interaction mm -hmm. of ideas that are quite opposite mm -hmm. to each other. I'd add that I'm not sure that character and resilience aren't helped by that process as well. It does. I always know that uh, whenever I faced strong criticisms and became embarrassed by my inability to respond to them, mm -hmm. those were the key moments where I really learned something very important. Uh, this issue of freedom of conscience has come to the fore a bit in this country recently, I think, and I'm testing your reactions here, a debate about religious freedom and how to preserve it uh, in the context of changing marriage laws. What seems to me to be being missed is most Australians would say, well, we're not personally particularly religious. But I actually think religious freedom is, if you like, almost a precursor to freedom of speech because it's really in the end freedom of conscience and the right to express it. And I'd make two points. The first is we don't want to deprive ourselves of the opportunity of hearing people we might disagree with very strongly in terms of their views on good and evil, of an afterlife, yeah. of salvation, whatever it happens to be. That's point one. The second point is this, though, the one that really frightens me. It seems to me, and I, I, it's something of a passing interest in history, that the minute you start to try and deny conscience, you'll find that people of strong conscience and often very noble conscience will feel obliged to speak out. So you've got to take ever more draconian efforts to silence them. And that, I think, is quite a chilling prospect. It is. Uh, if you look at it historically, uh, the freedom of speech became important because uh, Europe went through cent a centuries-long religious war yeah. between Catholics and Protestants. And people in Europe realized that unless we give freedom uh, for re expressing religious beliefs, we just kill each other. And our idea of tolerance was actually a pragmatic response to that at that stage in time. So in many respects, the freedom of religion is, as you suggest, logically prior to many of the other freedoms that we then went on to develop and, and cultivate. And it seems to me, and I say this as an atheist, without any kind of religious background, that we need to take seriously uh, the importance of religious freedom. Because unless people are able to act in accordance with their conscience and express their views, what we end up is storing a lot of trouble. Because basically, by not allowing people of faith to express themselves, what you're doing is you're actually denying their humanity. You're undermining their very existence in terms of who they are. And a civilized, educated society, no matter how secular, has got to take that on board. And, and in a sense, you know, sort of rather than see that as a problem, actually create a situation where people of, of religious uh, conviction are able to contribute to society in, in their own way. After all, we all bring something to the table. We all do, and so absolutely. You're a great enlightenment figure, uh, a supporter uh, and advocate, and I understand that entirely. It's been incredibly important for us. But if you take a couple of important social reforms like um, 
opposing slavery, in fact, decent labour laws for women and children, mm. ending of um, you know, the attitude that the colour of the skin determines your worth. The moral impulse from that actually came again from religion yeah. in America and in Britain. I don't think you would argue with that. Well, not just the moral impulse. I think that religion was the precursor of what today we see as science. Mm. Many of the religious insights uh, of some of the great mm. thinkers in the 16th, 17th century provided the intellectual resources mm. that helped uh, scientists kind of mm. develop their own way of making sense of mm. things. So whatever we are, wh whoever we are, and whatever we think about religion, it's got to have a place in our society uh, if we're going to have a balanced, mm harmonious way of going to the future. So Frank, to bring this home, um, I think it's fair to say that both you and I would concur with some of those thinkers around the place who are saying that all the old labels seem to have broken down. I mean, here I am, somebody who'd be characterised as a conservative, you perhaps as a, in old-fashioned language, as someone from the left, maybe you still use that terminology. And yet in reality, on some of the core issues, we're in, we're in furious agreement. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I've talked to other Australians who have sat on the other side of politics to me uh, and, and they would, I think, concur with the view that we have to now recast our language, um, that the old boxes don't work anymore. Absolutely. But the question is how? Well, I, I'm, I'm not going to give you an answer because I struggle <laughs> with it all the time. I remember uh, seven years ago, my son around the breakfast table saying, asking the question which completely caught me unaware, he said, Dad, are we left wing or right wing? And I know I never had to ask that question. I knew exactly what we were. But his question indicated that in his mind, the differences were far from evident. They weren't really clear. And I find that these days, left and right mm. are very old, confusing concepts. Yeah. And I find myself in strange alliances. In many situations, I've got friends and colleagues, collaborators who have a strong Christian religious kind of background who agree with me on a whole lot of things. There's a lot of secular people who share my atheism, have a political outlook that I find not very nice and, 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 and very aloof from my bearings. So we, at the moment, we're kind of all struggling. And I think that we're going to end up in a situation where people like you and me, regardless of our previous convictions, are going to develop uh, a set of ideas, uh, a certain a foundation on which we can, in a sense, uh, create a new kind of political outlook that takes the best of the past, the legacy of Western civilization, and we kind of add to it you know, if, on the basis of our own experience. And I've got no idea where we're going to end up, and I've got no idea what we're going to call it. But I find it very difficult to answer that question. People always ask me, how do you define your politics? And one day I say, I'm a liberal humanist. Next day I say, I'm a radical Democrat. I'm all, it depends on my mood, but I know exactly where I stand, but we lack a language to which we can express those kinds of sentiments. Well, thank you. I think perhaps all I would say is that I think we ought to begin by teaching our history properly and accurately so that we would understand help. our past. Yeah. We'll never understand where we are or where we need to go to if we don't know where we've come from. Yeah, as Cicero said that if a society that forgets its past will always be a child, they'll always be children. Easily led, as Karl Marx said, yeah. easily persuaded. And the other thing that I think would be furious agreement on as a platform is that we've got to respect the dignity and worth of all and recover on that basis respectful debate because it's the only way that we can find the best compromises in the middle because everything's a compromise in terms of public policy. Yeah. And the only way you and I are going to agree to that consensus is that we both feel we've been heard and respected. Absolutely. I think that being heard, allowing people's voices to be communicated is a precondition for a a genuine democratic public space. Thank you, Frank. If I had my way, every Australian in this country would hear what you've had to say today. Thanks very much. Pleasure. Thank you.